Welcome everyone to the April installment of the IPM Hour. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, today we have two speakers. Our, our first speaker is Gre uh, Greg Montez, who has been in the role of technical manager at Sutera for about two years. Uh, he was part of the opening of a new office for Sutera in California and a commitment to California agriculture um, back in 2020 that also included the hire of uh, Emily Sims, who was an orchard crops IPM advisor uh, for the Sacramento Valley for, for quite a few years. Uh, before this, uh, Greg worked at Trace, Eurofilms, AgriSciences, and the Citrus Lab in the Kearney Research Center in Parlier with uh, uh, Beth uh, Cardwell, uh, Grafton Cardwell. And uh, he also worked as an independent crop consultant in central Col Colorado. He received his degree in plant sciences slash plant protection from Fresno State. Uh, and during his time as a student, he worked on a project with Western Grape Leaf Skeletonizer with CDFA and also scouted cotton and alfalfa. He is currently a member of the uh, Association of Applied IPM Ecologists the National Association of Independent Crop Consultants, as well as the California Association of Pest Control Advisors. And uh, let's see, you know what? I forgot to look at your title. I guess you'll go ahead and tell us what that is. Take it away, Greg. Thank you for that, Matt, I appreciate. Um, yeah, you, you got the whole background on me. I, I, uh, uh, that's pretty, pretty uh, much been my career. Uh, so here we are, and uh, yes, uh, I've dabbled in pheromones now for you know, all of my professional career. Uh, I, at Fresno State, as an undergraduate, I worked with the Great Beast Skeletonizer and was so saturated with that pheromone that the little moths, little black moths would follow me in a plume across campus. It was, uh, it was quite a sight. Uh, Graduating, I, I went to the Central Valley, the, well, the San Luis Valley of Colorado and was trapping uh, cutworm and armyworm. Came back to California to start my master's degree and ended up at the Kearney Research Center where I spent the next 20 years. Now I'm with Sutera and uh, they treat me very, very well. Happy to be here, really strong tech team. And uh, the talk today, is about using a different formulation of pheromones than, than some have been used to seeing. Uh, the sprayable technology is, is what we're going to talk about today. The uh, ubiquitous disclaimer would be, uh, I am a card-carrying licensed pest control advisor, advisor but uh, this is for information purposes only educational. Uh, please don't construe anything in this talk as a recommendation. So having said that, pheromone, it's been my experience uh, talking to growers and pest control advisors and researchers, pheromones and insecticides often get equated and they're very, very different things. They both, they're both used to control insects but a pheromone has you no know, has no impact on the health of the insect at all. It's its communication system. The pheromone the insects do not have uh, callingmothonly.com. There is no Tinder for bugs. Uh, this is their internet. This is how one one sex attracts the other. Pheromones are really species specific. There are cases where one molecule might be used by different insects, but the ratios would be different. There would be ways to distinguish so the whole system doesn't get confused. Got to realize that these are very, very fragile molecules. They are, uh, they're, they're designed. They have been evolved to break very easily. Uh, the, the insect does not want to become its own mating disruptor. So it, the female makes these molecules, releases the molecules, they travel a short distance, and then they, they degrade, they oxidize, they photodegrade. There's a various ways of, uh, of a molecule, of a pheromone molecule to, to break. Uh, and that's by, by design. Pheromones, since there's no toxic component to them, 
uh, they, they they're very safe and they have no no uh, uh, pre-harvest interval or, or re-entry interval. And if I remember to use my mouse. So mating disruption is very, very different from a lure. The, the lures are designed to bring a male into a collection device by following a plume. Mating disruption doesn't do that. It's a different, different way of looking at things. If the male cannot find the female, it uses its life expectancy as, a, as an adult uh, to no purpose. It, it just uh, uses up its energy, falls to the ground, and, and does not forward its genetics. So mating disruption confuses the neighborhood. It's, uh, think of it as a fog or, or, or a cloud where the, the males just are just cannot track on the point source that they're looking for. So a lure is a, uh, the same as, as a female or even a stronger version of. A lure contains all of the molecules that a female would, would produce. That's not true for a mating disruptor or doesn't have to be true for a mating disruptor. It can mimic for the, for the male or the female only produces a single molecule for a pheromone like codling moth does, codlemone, uh, the mating disruption is competitive. Where the uh, female produces a blend or a mix of, of two or more molecules in her pheromone, it's not necessary to recreate that mix to be a mating disruption product. Only need one of them, and that would be the case of navel orange worm. That's a non-competitive mode of action. You, for the, there's nothing in the mating disruptor that attracts a male for navel orange worm. We're just saturating the area and confusing his, his uh, antennae that way. Lures are only active in a very small space, space uh, spatial area, typically not more than 50 feet from the trap where mating disruption is, entire, is engineered to work over the entire field. And an individual dispenser slash puffer can work for up to, up to an acre and cover that much, much space. Lures have a limited life, lifespan. Typically, eight weeks is the most you're going to get out of a lure. And when it gets hot in the, the summertime, when ambient air temperatures are over 90 degrees, my recommendation is to take a week off the, the longevity, the lifespan of a lure. That's not going to be true for a mating disruptor. Mating disruptors are engineered to persist, to keep that molecule protected for up to a year. So we have the lures and then three modes of getting pheromone out in mating disruption terms. The, the solid or the gel dispensers, uh, hang from a, a branch, uh, hang from a, a wire in, in a, a trellis. And those can be for one, sometimes we have combinations of these. So uh, one dispenser can handle two different species of, of pest. The active release aerosols, Puffer is trade named by Sutera. Uh, in fact, when I was with uh, Kearney Ag Center, Harry Shorey and I, it, and Roland Gerber, we all worked in the same space filling these things. Uh, very OSHA non approved, but uh, that was the genesis of the puffer. And I was privileged to, to have been there then. The new, well, actually, we'll, we'll get into that, but the, the topic I'd like to cover today, though, focuses on the sprayables. We tra uh, trademarked flowables, but uh, the sprayable microcaps are what. It, uh, today's talk is going to, to entail. And at, to this point, the sprayables are single species only. Uh, we've not found an effective way yet to combine two species into one microcap. Uh, and there's reasons for that. We'll get into that in a bit. The very first sprayable, the very first microcapped pheromone was gussie pluer for pink bullworm. In the, back in the, the late 80s. 
Sutera's first attempt at this was for tomato pinworm in 1996, so not too far after. And the technology has progressed significantly since then. You'll know uh, that the pink bollworm has been eradicated, uh, although the, uh, the plow down, the, the uh, residue destruct date still remains in effect, I believe. Um, pink bollworm has all been, been eliminated from Cal California and the, the, the pheromone was part of that process. So MEC, other companies use the term microencapsulated concentrate or microencapsulated formulation. The formulation code, the official is CS for capsule suspension, like an F for a flowable or an EC for an emulsifiable concentrate. The, the formulation code is CS. The only difference among the three platforms is the delivery system. So it's the same pheromone, same molecule in the microcap as you would find in a dispenser or in a puffer. Okay. These things are, these things required some serious engineering. Uh, other, other insecticides, other fungicides, and I believe there are even some herbicides that are microcapped. But the characteristics of the pheromone molecule are such that the cap walls had to be thin enough to allow the movement of pheromone molecule out at a sustained rate, but thick enough to protect that molecule from oxygen and from ultraviolet light and all the other degradation pathways that, that the pheromone molecule would, would encounter. So the, the engineering, the thickness, the composition, the size of these microbeads uh, it took a lot of effort to, to get to the point that they are now. It is a controlled release. It's not a linear curve. It is a degradation curve, uh, but uh, we can still get up to 30 days of activity uh, out, out of these microcaps. So just think of them as quadrillions, septillions of little dispensers all in, in one bottle, all in one, one application. Getting these incorporated into your, the IPM program, they, they have a definite fit in a number of ways. I'm gonna speed up here because I'm starting to pontificate. I hate it when that happens. It, uh, one of the aspects of the blowable pheromone is to prevent population increase from building in the first place. This is something that is used, mating disruption is something that can either be used proactively before the season, before the insects start flying, or reactively. In the case of the flowable, it can be used as needed, but it always must be used before a male flight occurs. So timing is important with, with these. They're specific to one target pest. They have no activity on any other beneficial insect or any other organism for that matter. It is a way of mitigating of getting a handle on in the development of insecticide resistance by preventing the, uh, the forwarding of genes that uh, may have evolved resist insecticide resistance. Uh, we're keeping the available toolbox in play. We're keeping the, uh, the use of certain insecticides available to, to the growers. And then of course the, the uh, uh, residue tolerances and the pre-harvest intervals, they're, they're uh, tech functionally non-existent for a pheromone because they are non-toxic. They're really easy to apply. They've been designed to be applied in standard application equipment, whether that's a orchard sprayer or an aircraft. We're doing trials with drones now to uh, see how ultra low volume we can get and get good control with. The, uh, the micro caps do not require contact with the insect as long as they're out there on foliage and surfaces in the orchard vineyard field, that's good enough. They'll do their thing, they'll release their pheromone, they'll be active. So they don't need to get up close and personal with the target insect like an insecticide would have to do. 
uh, that gives a lot larger freedom of, of motion. A, a applicator, a sprayer can move at, at a faster speed, can use lower volumes of, of water putting these on. The flowables or the sprayables are, are also intended for situations where a grower might not want to put out a season long dispenser or a season long puffer. This would certainly be the case for an orange orangeworm where the, uh, uh, the, the, the proactive treatment, putting out puffers would, would be you know, over $100 an acre or around $100 an acre. If a grower chooses to use the mating disruption, they can put it on per flight at about $30 per acre. So it's flexible in cost and in application time. Coming up on, on 20 minutes here, I don't, I don't want to hog the whole hour here. So we have some considerations when using the, the sprayables. We'll get about 30 days. Again, this is also temperature dependent and it's also crop dependent where you've got shade, uh, an almond orchard, a walnut orchard. The, uh, the uh, longevity of the microcaps would uh, be enhanced if they're put in the shade in a cooler environment. So over 90 degrees, they'll start to degrade a little more quickly. Be sure if you're using these things that to be tracking the degree days, that's very important. You do not want to miss the male flight because that would, that's, that's your target window. That's what you're aiming for is three days to seven to 10 days before the male flight. That's application, that's perfect application timing. And uh, where rainfall or overhead irrigation is expected, we do not want to wash the caps off the leaf surfaces, off the surface where they were applied. So that needs to be taken into account also. All pheromone mating disruptors will affect a pheromone-based trap. That's what they do. That's one of the ways we know they're working is if the trap is, is affected. Uh, keep that in mind. Monitoring becomes more difficult, but it still needs to be done when mating disruption is used. Puffers at one per acre, sprayable gives a contiguous coverage over the entire surface of where it's applied, whether that's broccoli or almonds, it would be the same. There are several, or these are the species that uh, a sprayable form of the pheromone are available for. We have more being worked on in the laboratory. Big ones for me personally are diamondback moth, uh, false coddling moth is going to be a, a, an issue coming up. And I'd really like to focus on vimealy bug for a bit because vimealy bug is very, very difficult to control with a traditional insecticide. The female hides underneath loose bark where it, it uh, can escape contact. If you're using a systemic insecticide, that's one thing, but a contact insecticide, the female vimealy bug can hide from. They cannot hide from the pheromone. The pheromone is out in the environment, in the ambient air. The males cannot find the females. They do not reproduce. So we have uh, several, several field trials. This is a vineyard sprayer. We're also doing some drone applications where sprayers, especially in wine grapes where the terrain is not suitable, where you've got mountains and odd shapes throughout the block, uh, the, the, the application by drone would be very, very efficient. And we've got trial, field trials working on that. Home stretch here, just a couple more slides. The, uh, the pheromone mating disruption, we're using it to maintain the usefulness of, of conventional insecticides. The uh, use of the mating disruption can either be proactive or reactive, depending on the, the pest control advisor and the crop and the grower. Size does matter. Mating disruption does work better where it works best if you have an area-wide management program. Uh, but the minimum field size will depend on the crop and what insect is being treated for. And mating disruption does not remove the need for field scouting. That's still an essential, that is still an essential part of the process, keeping the scouts out there. The sprayable formulations, uh, where, where terrain is tough to get into, or where 
there's nothing to hang a puffer from, the sprayables are an option. We've done a tremendous amount of engineering on these things. So uh, the effects are well known, we stand by them, and they're non-toxic. That sums up what I had to say about this. I would, uh, if the, here's my contact information. If you have any questions whatsoever, I'll be happy to help out. And I'll turn it over back to Matt now. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so I'm looking in the chat right now to see if there are any questions. I'm not seeing any questions at present, um, but if anybody would like, they can certainly unmute themselves and go ahead and uh, pose their question directly. I have a question. Greg. Is there a way to monitor how effective the pheromone still is? Um, you know as it gets closer to your 30 days or? Yeah. Yes, there is, Steve. Um, part of that is using, so we'll, we'll take uh, coddling moth, for example. It, uh, if we're using mating disruption for coddling moth, you should always have the, the 1X lures out in the orchard to make to keep tabs on, on the flow of pheromone. If you're catching a moth in a 1X trap for, for coddling moth, then somewhere along the line, the mating disruption has worn off, worn off or, or, or needs to be reassessed. Mm -hmm. So yes, having a pheromone trap out is an indication of, is it still active? Um, and with the sprayables, uh, that's, that's entirely important for, for diamondback moth because you're dealing with a low-lying crop. There's no, not a lot of canopy. There's hardly any canopy. And so having the traps out there are, are the best situation. We, we could take a portable, a spectrophotometer out, but not very many PCAs have one in, in their track. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I had a question as well. Um, so I noticed, yeah, there's no uh, maximum res residue. It seemed like you could apply it uh, pretty late and stuff. Um, Absolutely. So are these are these plastic beads? I mean, so that they would still be on the the tissue, right? Yes. Uh, it's it's not as simple as nylon, uh, but it is a, a plastic bead. That, that is correct, but it's, it's the molecular composition. They would, they would shoot me if I, if I divulged that. Um, but uh, yes, the, there's, there's two things to look at. One, in, in the standard rain, pesticide application, uh, most everything has days before harvest or days before reentry. Uh, where was I going to? I was I was about to say something really profound, and it just went over my head. Um, <laughs> I hate it when that happens. But uh, uh, thirty days, is, is, we will stand be, stand behind that, in, unless it's getting up over hundred degrees ambient, and which it does here in Fresno. Uh, but uh, but yes, the, the the pheromones are subject to to uh, temperature degradation, thermal degradation. And then uh, one more question. Um, have you looked into tank mixing or is that allowed with these? Do, do tank mixes degrade them or has that been looked into at all? We have an entire laboratory grant devoted to doing compatibility studies and uh, almost 95% of agricultural chemicals are play nice with, with microcaps. Uh, if you leave a microcap solution combined with a emulsifiable concentrate or a strong solvent for a prolonged period of time, that's not good. And we never want to have the microcaps frozen. That's the worst because freezing will actually break the beads and you'll end up with pheromone water, which would disperse on contact once it's applied. Mm -hmm. so, so don't let them freeze and uh, don't mix with strong acids or strong solvents. But other than that, we play nice with everybody. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, I am not seeing any additional questions. So thanks, Greg. Uh, and I think we'll go ahead and move on to our second presentation. So that's uh, Brett Warnacki, who has been a faculty researcher at Oregon State University for about three years. Uh, Brett received a bachelor's degree in horticultural science with a minor in business administration from Colorado State. And then he also got his master's degree in plant pathology from Oregon State. Uh, Brett has worked on intelligent spray systems, 
uh, in orchard crops, improving African land races of sorghum, and developing detection procedures for Puccinia punctiformis on Canadian thistle. And today he's going to talk about his work on intelligent spray systems in, I think it's mostly grapes, Brett, but I'm, maybe it's wider than that. I'm not sure. Yeah, so this presentation is just going to be on grapes. We, we have done uh, other work on nursery crops and in hazelnuts. So I'll get my screen shared and we'll get moving. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen there. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about some work that we've done uh, evaluating the intelligent spray system and specifically sulfur for management of grape powdery mildew. So just an outline of what I'm gonna be going into, uh, just a little bit of background first, kind of give you a lowdown of the intelligence prayer project. And then I'll be going through our three years of trials that we did these past three years. Um, we received the sprayer in 2018 and then uh, subsequently did these three years of trials in grapes. Um, also just a little bit of uh, some other stuff where we got going and then uh, upcoming work. So the Intelligence Spray Project is uh, spread across the U.S. It uh, was originally developed at the USDA ARS Application Technology Research Unit uh, in Worcester, Ohio, um, collaborating with Ohio State University. And since then, uh, these sprayers have been uh, dispersed across the U.S. to various universities to look at different crops and uh, specialty crops mainly. So I'm gonna share a video real quick. So I'm gonna stop my share and then uh, share my video here, um, just to give you an idea of what this uh, sprayer looks like. So hopefully you can see this video. Um, so this was this is the concept, uh, concept proven model of the intelligence sprayer. We, we like to call it the Doc Ock. And what you're seeing here is the nozzles uh, that see foliage, um, they turn on and they turn off you know, in, in these spaces between the trees. And another thing that's cool about the sprayer is when the nozzles turn on, they sense the amount of the density of the, the plant foliage and then uh, adjust the amount of spray volume accordingly to um, a specified rate. All right, now let me go back to the presentation here. All right. Lots of clicking back and forth. Um, so just generally, uh, with these intelligent spray systems, because they're pulsing on and off and sensing that foliage and changing the amount of, of material they're applying, um, they, they require much less pesticide. If there's a gap between the trees, they stop. Um, if there's less foliage, they apply less pesticide. So that's the main efficiency improvement. And then there's a cascading set of uh, other things that happen. You have less diesel required because you don't, don't have to fill up as much less labor hours required because, again, you don't have to fill up as much and less water, which, you know, for dryland applications is really important. Um, and then, of course, uh, less release into the environment down in this figure here. Um, you know, the, that sprayer would be turning off between the trees, so that would, that would help a bit. Um, in terms of savings, how much are we talking about? Uh, it varies, so 13 to 71% is kind of a general range. Um, the more variability, you know, the more gaps, the more uh, heavy foliage to less foliage in a, in a block, um, the more there's, you're going to save. But, you know, grapes or other hedgerow, more uniform crops, um, there's less savings there just because there's less, uh, you know, variation to, to accommodate. But yeah, we can see here 60% of spray savings in apples, 29% of peaches, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and just the most important efficiency improvement with this technology is just more time to you can fit applications into, into more time. So these two figures show a constant rate sprayer and a variable rate LIDAR sprayer on the right. Um, so you can see it takes 30 minutes per uh, hectare. Um, so that's the same amount of spray time, but then you get these other efficiency improvements. Uh, refilling takes you know less than half the time and then travel to the um, refill uh, station also takes you know uh, less than half the time just because there's less refilling happening. So that's really the most important aspect of it. Um, so once that Doc Ock sprayer was developed and proven to be effective, uh, the next stage of the project was to come up with a universal retrofit uh, kit that can be put on just about any sprayer. And then that's where we come in. So we got a uh, 
mini pack blast, a 50 gallon, just standard air blast sprayer that was retrofitted with the system back in 2018. Um, and there I am with uh, Stephanie Heckard, another faculty research assistant in our lab, standing with the sprayer in a hazelnut orchard. So our approach when we got the system was to uh, use sulfur, which is a contact fungicide material. It really needs to be adequately covered. Every tissue needs to be covered, ideally, uh, to get good control um, and great powdery mildew. In the Willamette Valley of Oregon, where we're located, um, mildew is great powdery mildew is just a, a problem every year and it's if you don't control it it's it's a big issue and luckily we have a, a research vineyard where uh, we can let it run out of control and we can have non-treated controls as our checks and um, that's all good so that's where we did this work um, and then i'm going to do another quick video bear with me um, I'll have to start it from the file. It wouldn't let me open two different windows. Uh, let's see here. Let's pause that. Uh, stop share. Share screen. And this is, so this will be our system in effect. So hopefully you can see that now. Uh, so there's our, there's our tractor and the sprayer. You can see it pulsing very rapidly behind as it, you know, just that that spray volume. Um, so here's what conventional spraying looks like, just full nozzles open, just blasting air and, and spray at the vines. Um, you can notice that gap there between the tree, uh, the vines that'll become, so here it is, it hits that gap. You can see it kind of turns off there and then comes back full force when it hits that, those other vines. It'll be a slow-mo coming up here in a second too. Um, and we can really see where it turns off and adjust the amount of spray um, as it goes. So um, as it's coming up to this, this gap where there's those trellis wires, it still pulses, which it sees the trellis wires. It doesn't distinguish between inanimate objects and plants. But then when it comes back, you can see how it just starts to really flow once it hits that foliage. Um, just a quick cluster view just for fun. Um, so here, what I want to draw your attention to is it's spraying the trunks. So even though, you know, we, we are normally would have this nozzle turned off, but you can see if you focus on that bottom nozzle on the sprayer, um, where it comes on just for one second when it passes those trunks. Yep, just right there, just spritzed a couple of times. So um, just kind of cool to where it, it uses a LIDAR sensor and uh, senses those all those trunks there. So pretty cool. Um, let me stop and switch back to presentation. All right. Hopefully I'm back there. You guys can see that slideshow. Okay. Um, so I'll go into our uh, research now. So um, from 2018 to 2020, we did these trials in Pinot Noir and we have about five treatments. So we have the non-treated. Um, we had sulfur at 10 pounds per 100 gallons and automated is the uh, the word that I'll use to refer to the intelligent sprayer doing its intelligent spray thing where it's turning on and off and all that. Um, we also had that same treatment at standard. So it's just that full on turn off just with a switch type type operation. Um, also in 2018 only, we did a five pounds per acre kind of at the request of some growers up in the valley here. And we did uh, a, a higher concentration um, which I'll get into in a minute, but 20 pounds for 100 gallons, so four times that uh, other other concentration. Um, and then also uh, just a standard rate, uh, standard mode of that 20 pounds for 100 gallons. And for that treatment, we drove uh, 4.5 miles per hour. All these other treatments, we were driving at two miles per hour. Um, the reason we drove at, at that fast for um, that 20 pounds standard treatment was because uh, we, we need to stay within the label rate of the sulfur product microthiol dispersed that we used. So right into the data here, um, leaf incidence of powdery mildew on the left side, cluster severity on the right. Um, so the AUDPC kind of just a, a way to um, look at leaf incidence over time. And these bars represent kind of the summation of the disease over the course of the season. And on the right hand side, there's mean percent infected berries on the Y axis there. So that's basically the, the amount of the cluster that was covered excuse me, with powdery mildew um, in these various treatments. 
Um, and there's a similar trend between the, uh, the leaf incidence and the cluster severity. So we can see that that five pounds per 100 gallons, which is a standard rate of sulfur that growers apply in the Willamette Valley, um, really just was not effective when it was applied in, in the intelligence sprayer. Um, but the, the standard mode did, did quite well, um, just, and that's, you know, that's a standard rate. So we expected that, um, that five pounds per acre um, and the 20 pounds per 100 gallon standard, this is 2018 data only, um, also to control to mildew on the clusters and leaves uh, pretty well. So we, were, we just, you know, started scratching our heads that first year after we got it, you know, why was this system that was supposed to be the greatest, so, sorry, the ISS is the intelligence spray system. Why was it less effective? I mean, it could be the lower coverage of tissues because we're using sulfur, or it could just be because there's such a low volume that there's just not very much sulfur being applied. Um, so our approach after that was to evaluate spray coverage. So we used water sensitive cards and the same settings that we used in the, uh, the, the sulfur trial. So that's two miles per hour in both intelligent uh, automated mode and uh, standard mode, and then also that faster, faster speed. Um, for this covered trial, we had cards that were uh, water sensitive cards that were clipped back to back. Um, and then they were clipped in the cluster zone. So there were three sets of those that were dispersed in these uh, plots that we were spraying. And then we also had some cards in the upper canopy. I won't be talking about those for the sake of time, but back to back cards. So they were getting sprayed from, from both sides. Um, we placed the cards on, we alternated where we were placing them so that when we placed them from the west side, they were kind of a little bit more on the west side, but then one of those cards would have been facing the canopy through the east side. So um, those cards that were facing just out kind of closer to the external part of the canopy, we termed outer facing cards. And then the terms that were kind of facing into the canopy were, were termed inner facing cards. So on in those outer facing cards that were more exposed, there was no significant differences in any of those uh, spray settings. Um, but in those inner facing cards, that standard mode slower speed just had had significantly more coverage um, than those two others. But if, if we recall that standard mode uh, 4.5 miles per hour uh, treatment where we apply that higher uh, rate of sulfur, um, that had good control. So even though it appears to have a little less coverage here, um, we think that coverage trial helped us determine that really the issue was the amount of sulfur going out. So this is a a figure of the amount of sulfur that went out in each one of the applications of 2018. Um, so those are down on that x-axis and then the amount of sulfur applied on a per acre basis on the y-axis. Um, and the green line down at the very bottom there uh, with that's dotted is the uh, intelligence sprayer. So we can see that it was below three pounds per acre for the entire season for each application. And the label rate of that sulfur product is from three to 10 pounds per acre. So it was below the label rate for the entire season when we mixed that kind of just standard concentration. So going into 2019 and 2020, we knew we needed to increase the amount of sulfur applied in automated mode. So you could increase the, the concentration. So we did that in the PNOR trial. Um, there's also a spray rate parameter which adjusts the amount of spray per unit foliage. Um, we did that in the Pinot Gris trial. Um, and then we also thought uh, testing a synthetic fungicide that would redistribute uh, would be a little systemic. Um, we would try that as well. So uh, this is the Pinot Noir data. So we had the increased concentration of sulfur here. And we can see again, you know, we, we kept those same treatments. We have that five pounds per 100 gallons automated. Again, did not do well on the leaves. But then when we increased that concentration, it, it had the same amount of, you know, similar amount of control as that 20 pounds per 100 gallon standard and that five pounds per 100 gallon standard. So it did a better job when we increased the amount of sulfur. And 2020 data from that same trial, again, looking at leaf incidence, um, a similar result where that higher concentration of sulfur really did um, in the blue bar there, um, uh, improve control. And then now going uh, into the cluster data, um, again, a similar, a similar story here, that five pounds per 100 gallon uh, treatment uh, just did not help those clusters, you know, right around 75% of those clusters in that treatment were covered with mildew. Whereas with these other, um, the higher rate there is in orange, I guess. Um, it did have, it did have a little bit uh, higher than the others, but I believe they were not significantly different. Although I guess I don't have my letters in this figure. Um, in 2020, um, again, uh, a similar, a similar result. Um, I guess it did uh, have significantly higher 
uh, a little bit higher um, cluster severity that year, uh, the 20 pounds per 100 gallons. But uh, again, quite quite a bit less than that uh, five pounds per 100 gallons automated treatment. So increasing the, the concentration really did help. Um, in terms of the Pinot Gris treatment, so these experiments were done in 2019 and 2020. Um, we have that non-treated, of course, that same rate of sulfur that we did in the Pinot Noir, five pounds per 100 gallons, just standard. Um, and then now I'm going to be getting into, um, we have that five pounds per 100 gallons again in automated mode. And this is the spray rate that I've been talking about, the spray rate parameter. Um, it's quoted in our system in terms of fluid ounces per cubic foot of canopy. Um, so that was the standard that it came with. It came set at 0 0.06 fluid ounces per cubic foot. Um, we increased that for another treatment to uh, double, so 0.12 fluid ounces per cubic foot with the same concentration of sulfur. And then for our synthetic uh, treatment, we did Vivando Endura tank mixed, alternated with Torino Quintec, and at that lower spray rate of the intelligent spray system. Um, in terms of what we found in 2019, this is leaf incidence here. Um, again, that five pounds more per 100 gallons uh, sulfur treatment did not do a very good job. Um, when we increased the spray rate, um, it did uh, decrease the amount of uh, mildew that we observed. So it did work. Um, and I guess it's not significantly different in this figure, but I think in the next figure it is. And then that, that uh, synthetic treatment did, did very well. So hardly any mildew at all in those plots. Um, and so here's leaf incidents from 2020. Um, similar result again. So this time it uh, was significantly lower leaf incidence than that. Uh, five pounds per 100 gallons uh, treatment when we increase that spray rate. In terms of cluster severity, again, a, a similar observation. Um, the, again, that five pounds per 100 gallons automated treatment just did not do a good job. But when we increase that spray rate um, represented by that this yellow bar here, um, it did quite quite a bit better, um, just putting out more spray per unit foliage. And again, that, that synthetic treatment just did a very good job, even though it was applied in that low spray rate. Um, so 2020, um, again, fairly consistent uh, across the years um, where increasing that spray rate did significantly lower the amount of, of uh, powdery mildew on these clusters. And then again, the, uh, the synthetic treatment did, did a good job at that low spray rate in intelligent mode. So uh, just uh, some conclusions here about those trials. Um, sulfur just didn't work. And that's just a standard rate that gets applied throughout the Willamette Valley of Oregon. It just didn't work uh, just out of the box with those settings that the intelligent sprayer came with. Um, but increasing the concentration of sulfur or increasing that spray rate would be a way to uh, get better control. Um, and yeah, overall, it's an effective system. It's just when we're applying these contact materials um, there's other considerations there that uh, growers should take into, into, cons into uh, consideration before they're going into it. Um, just kind of a little bit about some other stuff that we're working on. This was just um, some of the grape work, but we have done some work uh, looking at spray coverage on hazelnut shoot tips, which is where uh, eastern filbert blight infects uh, the, the tissues. Um, we've also looked at, we have some colleagues up at the North Willamette, I'm in Corvallis, but uh, there's some, some folks up at the North Willamette Research and Extension sta uh, Station who also have an intelligence sprayer very similar to this tower sprayer uh, in the middle photo there. Um, and they do research more on ornamentals. So uh, we've done some work on boxwoods, working with some nurseries where boxwood blight is the agent of concern there. Um, and then also uh, they have a new tower spray up there, so they're going to do some more uh, shade tree work. I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, intelligence spray team at OSU and the SCRI grant that uh, funded a lot of this work, um, and then some of the other uh, colleagues from Worcester and around the valley that have helped uh, with this research. And I could take any comments or questions. Well, thanks, Brent. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet. And uh, so I'd just like to invite anybody who has a question, if you'd like, you can just go ahead and take your mic off of mute and pose your question, or you yeah, can Brent, type it into chat. I've got a question for you, Brent. Uh, what level of technology is required to run that sprayer? Is it like a Raspberry Pi, or do you need a, like a laptop to perform that computation, the spatial computations? Yeah, so um, 
it is a tablet and uh, some a circuit board as well. That's the flow controller. Um, so this system, we, we have the research version in Oregon um, that we did our, our uh, research with. Um, but there is a company called Smart Guided Systems that commercialized this technology. And there, so you can buy it just on the market. Um, and they use a Android tablet um, for the interface. Um, I believe there's, I think that's the only computer involved, but then there's another circuit board and whatnot. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And there's no spatial part of it. it it's just a, it, it's a constantly uh, going system. So it just live through the field um, in real time does this stuff. So there's no like mapping or anything like that that happens. So I was, I was wondering, Brent, um, are you going to extend, expand your analysis of results to include economics? You know, we would like to. Uh, we don't have that expertise on our team, um, but we, we would definitely like to. And we've thought about that, but uh, it hasn't been a priority yet. We've more just been getting the system and figuring it out. And uh, hopefully that's that's coming. Yeah, Some folks out. Oh, sorry. Most of the costs would be pretty standardized. So you could just factor them in with simple uh, rates, cost rates. And then, uh, you know, to convince the growers to adopt, you really probably need that argument. Definitely. And I, they have done some good work um, in some of those figures that I, I was showing. There's some good papers behind those um, that have come out of Ohio and that, that type of area. Um, so yeah, we have not done that work here, um, but yeah, hopefully it will be coming. Our, part of our issue is we're doing a lot of this research on, you know, small plots. Mm -hmm. So uh, to really see these efficiency improvements, you, you need to be in a large, yeah. you know, a large operation because um, that's really where it shines. So hopefully down the line, uh, we could partner with some some larger operations and, you know, get more into that. And then Brent. on the grapes, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, you had the um, area under the disease curve, mm -hmm. but but what about the actual wine quality, it, you know? What's the effect, what's the threshold? Yeah, so the threshold is low. I mean, in terms of uh, powdery mildew and sensory defects, I, I know that sub three percent is has been quoted mm -hmm. as the amount of berries covered mm -hmm. that would uh, result in some issues. Um, our results are not indicative of a commercial setting, though. We have a lot of mildew at our farm, and it just kind of runs rampant. You know, especially you know we have non-treaty controls, so. Um, mm. and I think our strategies, you know, even though we were seeing 10, 20, 30% of mildew in some of those treatments, I think they would be effective in a commercial vineyard as well. Obviously, uh, depending on what, uh, what type of programs they're applying and, you know, with these other things that we learned taken into consideration, but, but yeah. Thanks. Brent, yep. we have one question in the chat and the question is at the higher rate or higher volume, what was the difference in active ingredient used in the ISS system versus the standard system? Yeah, let me see here. I, I, I can show a figure um, on that if you just bear with me for a second. Um, I think it was almost double. It wasn't quite double, but it was almost double. So let me see here. 2020 is a PM Gree. GPA, let's see, sulfur color. All right, let me get this up. Share screen. Okay, so here should be that figure. Yep. Okay, so yeah, the green is the, so yeah, it's, it actually is not even double. So um, the green is the just that lower spray rate, and the yellow is mm -hmm. that higher spray rate. So uh, yeah, it looks like it got up to around four pounds per acre towards the end of the season. I think one of the key aspects mm -hmm. of this and why that treatment did a little bit better was uh, bloom occurred right around June, like the first week of June. So we see that it's hitting that lowest label rate, that three pounds per acre, um, right around bloom. And bloom is a very critical mm -hmm. time to get your efficacious fungicides on. So uh, 
yeah, anyway, thanks for the question. Hopefully that, that clears it up. All righty. I am not seeing any additional questions. So I would just like to take the opportunity to thank Brent and Greg for their presentations. And I would like to remind everyone as well that we have the uh, May version of uh, IPM Hour coming up, May 12th, I believe. That's correct. Uh, and uh, I think Steve may already have people lined up for that. I do. You're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Yes. Yeah. And the other is um, Carrie Wimbless on um, some urban topic, and I don't remember off the top of my head what it is. Well, we if, uh, if you want to find out uh, ahead of time, you can certainly find out through the newsletter, which will be coming out uh, the second Wednesday of the month. First. First Wednesday of the month, yeah. This happens uh, this Wednesday of the month. Yeah, that's right. This this month was the second. So stay tuned uh, to the newsletter and you can find out ahead of time or you can always check it on the website as well where it will be posted ahead of time. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and hopefully we'll see many of you on the 12th. Take care. <laughs>